A very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, I would like to greet and welcome all the participants of this panel discussion as well as the delegates and panel members uh, to this international discussion, which is the third in the series hosted by the Department of Orthodontics and Dentofacial Orthopedics, the Faculty of Dental Sciences under the Ramaya University of Applied Sciences University. This is our panel discussion in which we are hosting in collaboration with the Department of Orthodontics, the College of Dentistry, University of Illinois, Chicago. It was Alfred Hitchcock who said, ideas can come from everything. And that is what our aim is for today's discussion, to inspire our participants and delegates to think and to sow the seeds of new ideas and also to improve our understanding on this current important topic. I, Dr. Sharanya Sadrish, Associate Professor in the Orthodontics Department, on behalf of my entire department, would like to begin this panel discussion by welcoming our patrons and dignitaries who have joined us today. I'd like to welcome our Pro Vice Chancellor, sir, to begin with, Dr. O.P. Kharbanda, sir, who has supported us in our, all our efforts to organize this panel discussion and all other endeavors. I welcome our Dean, Dr. Silju Matthew, sir, and the head of the department, Dr. Prashant G.S., to the web for this panel discussion. I also wish a very good morning to our guests from Chicago and the U.S. I welcome Dr. Sat Allah Reddy, sir, and his team from UIC Chicago, who are instrumental in this collaborative series, which we have been hosting between our two institutions. I take great pleasure in also welcoming our four panel members Panel members today. We have Dr. Mohammad El Nagar, Dr. Sumit Yadav, Dr. Balaji, and Dr. Prashant in the panel today. To begin with, first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Opi Khadbanda, sir, and request him to say a few words. Most of you already know Dr. O.P. sir very well. He is formerly the Dr. C.G. Pandit National Chair conferred by the Indian Council of Medical Research, and he was positioned at the All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. He is also the former Chief of Center of Dental Education and Research at Ames, New Delhi. He has served many additional roles I, as the I director think, of the... I think that's good enough. <laughs> All right, sir. Uh, we would like to begin this webinar today, this panel discussion today, with a few words from Dr. O.P., sir. Over to you, sir. You know, <clears throat> the, the current... Am I audible? Audible. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the, the current challenge with aligner is number one that the traditional orthodontists don't believe that they work. So we have to unlearn to learn. That is the first challenge number one. The challenge number two is that the cost. And challenge number three, cooperation from the patient. And the biggest challenge is that with the introduction of aligners, the science of orthodontics has been kept aside. Not not by the author, but by the manufacturer. So uh, the other major concern is that aligners are not part of curriculum. Consequently, while in the dental school, we still teach traditional appliance. The Aligners are usually supported by the trade company. So I think we have um, esteemed and experts here, and they will like to share their views about it. In addition to what they have in their mind here. Yeah. 
Over to you, Dr. Sharanya. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for joining us today, despite your busy schedule. I know you have to travel, but thank you for taking the time, sir. I'd like to. Next... Uh, I will be leave, leaving in few minutes because oh. I have a flight to catch. <laughs> yes. So uh, I will please be excused. Excused after half an hour. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, could we have? Uh, can I please invite uh, Dr. Silju Matthew, sir, to welcome everyone? Thank you, Dr. Sharania. Am I audible? Yes, 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 sir. Yes. OK, uh, very good morning uh, to our esteemed speakers who are joining us from uh, US and uh, good morning to all our friends back home. Uh, Professor Hopi Karmanda, sir, I'm so happy that uh, you could raise the occasion. Uh, Professor Allah Reddy, Professor Mohammed Lagnar, uh, Dr. Sumit Yadav, a few of the international guests who have joined us from various parts of the world friends from across the country, from Indian Orthodontic Society, for them who have joined us, colleagues and uh, dear students. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to welcome you all to this webinar based panel discussion on orthodontic clear aligners in the present era. Today, we stand at an exciting crossroads in the field of orthodontics, witnessing remarkable advancements that have transformed the way we approach teeth straightening and smile enhancement. In this present era, marked by an emphasis on personal well-being and self-confidence, orthodontic care has transcended its functional aspects to embrace the more exciting aesthetic concerns. Clear aligners have emerged as a powerful tool in achieving dental harmony without compromising on appearance or aesthetics. Their non-invasive nature ease of use and minimal interferences with the daily life has made them a preferred choice for a growing number of individuals seeking orthodontic care. One of the pivotal advantages of clear aligners is the digitalization of the entire treatment process, leveraging on cutting edge technology like the 3D scanning, computer aided design, simulations, Orthodontists can now offer personalized treatment uh, plans which are tailored to each patient's unique needs. This not only enhances the precision of treatment, but also empowers patients to visualize the treatment journey right from the beginning till the end. However, with great innovations comes the responsibility of professionalism, ethics and proper implementation. As professionals dedicated to enhancing oral care and smiles, we must ensure that approach to clear aligner therapy is rooted in a solid understanding of dental biomechanics and patient management. Rigorous training and continuous education are imperative to harness the full. We are joined by some of the experts from across the world. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Alna from UIC Chicago, uh, Dr. Sumit Yadav from UNMC in Nebraska. We also have uh, Dr. Allah Reddy who has joined us and Dr. Balaji from Chennai. And we have our own Dr. Prashant who will be joining us from Bangalore. They will dwell into the depths of this revolutionary treatment modality. And our discussion will span a range of very interesting and very absorbing topics, which are very contemporary, like the recent advances in aligner materials. This is one area we are seeing a lot of lot of new things coming up and, and it's, it's rapidly evolving field. Staging in aligner treatment, conventional versus optimized attachments, which is a very hot topic. Digitalization aligner therapy, non-tracking and the management of it. Refinements, how do you manage it? The menace of do-it-yourself aligners, which is a global problem. I'm sure uh, there's a lot of uh, issues back in US and uh, we are also facing the same problem and it would be nice to see how you people are tackling it there so that we can accordingly plan uh, to address those issues. And finally, of course, in-house aligners, Dr. Balaji is an expert in that and he would uh, enlighten us about its challenges. So finally, to conclude, I extend my gratitude to each of you for joining us on this occasion. Your presence signifies your dedication to staying at the forefront of orthodontic innovation. I'm confident that our collective efforts will further 
elevate the practice of orthodontics and pave the way for even more exciting breakthroughs in the future. Wishing you all a wonderful Varamvarma Mahalakshmi Vrata a festival that is going to be celebrated in India tomorrow. Thank you, and let's make this webinar an enlightening experience for all. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Sharani. Thank you, sir. Uh, with, without wasting any more time, let us begin with today's panel discussion, before which I will be introducing our four experts to the delegates who are present here today. First and foremost, we have with us Dr. Sumit Yadav, who has done his BDS and MDS from India, and then he went on to continue to do his PhD and, he sub and also his MBA. He has published extensively and he is an uh, presently as, uh, uh, started his academic career at Yukon Health as an assistant professor. He is also funded through the NIH and the American Association of Orthodontic Foundation on cellular and genetic control of orthodontic tooth movement and alveolar bone. And he's, his research includes a lot about the understanding and developing biotherapeutics for preventing TMJ, TMJ degeneration. So I welcome Dr. Sumit Yadav, sir. We also have the next panel member is Dr. Mohammad El Nagar, who is the, an assistant professor in the Department of Orthodontics at UIC Chicago. Uh, his practices is focused on digital orthodontics, dentofacial orthopedics with skeletal anchorage, as well as surgical orthodontics. And he's also the director of the digital and AI lab in UIC Chicago. And his research in interests include 3D imaging, 3D printing tags, artificial intelligence, etc. Welcome to Dr. El Nagasa as well. Everyone. We also have with us uh, the esteemed Dr. Balaji Krishnan, sir, who's the head of the department in Tagore Dental College and Hospital. Uh, as Dr. As uh, Siljusa already in mentioned, Dr. Balaji is very much interested in new technologies and is passionate about learning them. And he has been into in-house aligners for almost five years now and has performed over 200 in-house aligner cases. He owns a fully equipped in-house aligner setup in his clinic, ranging from intraoral scanners, software, 3D printers, etc. He has also conducted several courses on in-house aligners all around India and has motivated many other practitioners to get into this. So thank you, sir, for joining us today. And last but not the least, we have the head of the Department of Orthodontics in Ramaya, Dr. Prashant GS. Sir has completed his MOS from the Royal College of Edinburgh in UK, and he is also considered to be an expert in the field of aligners. Sir has conducted several courses on the biomechanics of aligners, handling various malocclusions through clear aligner therapy, and also the basic concepts of aligner therapy at multiple conferences and conventions throughout India. He's also been the resource person in Damon workshops, cephalometric workshops, and digital dentistry workshops. So I welcome Dr. Prashant sir as well. So let us begin today's panel discussion with a basic simple con uh, uh, topic, which is the effectiveness of clear aligners versus fixed braces. So I would like to open this discussion up to the four panel members. So the first topic which we are addressing is the effectiveness of clear aligners versus fixed braces. Dr. Sumit Yadav, can you please begin the discussion? Like effectiveness uh, depends a lot on what you are treating, like what kind of a malocclusion you are treating. And you know, like if you directly want to compare the effectiveness, um, the research paper has shown that you know, like up to moderate malocclusion, you know, like clear liners are close to 70% effective. But if the malocclusion is complex, right, uh, the clear aligners only show the efficiency or efficacy of 50%. Again, you're like, what kind of a tooth movement you are targeting? You're targeting space closure, it's 45%. And you are targeting in like extrusion, it's 20%. You're targeting root control, it's 20%. You are doing trying to do torque, it's less than 20%. So you know, like, uh, if you're doing a crowding case with extraction, right, where the roots are already positioned at the right place, and you just do the crown tipping, in that case, clear liners are very, good or uh, they are perfectly effective as braces so you know, like uh 
totally depending on what kind of a malocclusion you will target. If you're trying to target open bite, you know, like that's clear liners are shown to be effective because they have a bite plate effect, which intrude your molars. So you know, like, again, I will just say that depending on the malocclusion, we have to decide whether we do fixed braces or clear liners. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Yada have summarized uh, in terms of effectiveness. So it's basically dependent case selection and type to tooth movement you are planning to do. Uh, so uh, there is a recent article in Asia. It showed there is a, a percentage of patients who have a uh, go three clear aligners. At some point, they switch to fixed braces. Um, and the summarized, there were more complex cases. Uh, the cases that require uh, expansion and root control or rotation control. Um, so still, uh, maybe braces have a little bit upper hand in terms of uh, tooth movement control um, due to the fact that clear aligner mechanics it depends on in, in push movements. So we have a, a point of application of force, so it, it depends on pushing the tooth surface and how much is the push surface. Um, but recently, we, we learned about the clear aligner biomechanics, and we in your setup, um, you need to tackle um the limitations of clear aligners that's why in your setup in your clean check like in your uh, setup you, we tend toward over engineering for some movement um so your your final setup is not like the final occlusion that you want to see you need to over engineer for example correction of deep bite you need to have um some over intrusion in terms of your final setup um so you can tackle uh the clear aligner limitation but uh, I think uh, the mechanics and understanding is evolving um, and a lot of um, currently software, they have an implemented algorithm that can um, tackle this, but still braces in some areas and especially complex cases um, have a little bit more efficacy. Thank you. Uh so uh, the effectiveness of uh, the uh, fixed appliance, like uh, I would agree with uh, both the doctors here. So complex cases are going to be a bit of a problem with the aligners. Uh, I hope I'm audible, right? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes. yes. Okay, so uh, see the effectiveness, uh, see what the, the appliance, the fixed appliance have evolved and has come a long way. The aligners are just recent when you compare with the fixed appliance and a lot of researchers. Materials, especially the plastics which we are using, okay, they don't uh, give you that much of uh, effectiveness to perform complex movements. So uh, you see, you can give a very good attachment, okay, very effective attachment, but the quality and the uh, uh, the quality of the plastic which we are using. Uh, is going to, uh, at the end of the day, is going to give you the results, okay? So it might be good in a digital plan, but the actual outcome uh, won't be there. So I would say, uh, you know, for a beginner who is wanting to start aligners, I would not uh, tell them to take up complex cases because leave that to the fixed appliance and uh, whatever said and done, for maybe a few years, uh, you know, fixed appliance will have its place, but gradually only it can be replaced by plastic or some other appliance, which is even better than the aligners, I would say. Good evening. Uh, I do agree with other panelists that the case selection is very, very important here. Okay. So, but with the introduction of uh, the third generation aligners, where the manufacturer's software selects a particular type of attachment based on the computer logarithms, you know, the tooth movements are can be simulated very much close to the the ones which we are going to achieve with the fixed braces. So, uh, as per the uh, Dr. Sumit's uh, um, uh, statistics, I think. The effectiveness has increased very much uh, with the introduction of third generation aligners.
Thank you, sir. Thank you to all the members. At this stage, I request if there are any questions from the audience regarding this particular topic of discussion, you can post it now and unmute yourself. If not, we'll be moving on to the next uh, topic of the discussion. I uh, I may add uh, one bit here, uh, probably uh, the uh, in a in the case of a fixed appliance, uh, you know, uh, the tooth can easily move up. Say, for example, in a crowded case, uh, you can move the teeth left, right, you know, like buccal or lingual or mesial or distal. But in the case of an aligner, it's totally covered. So kind of. It's 360 degrees covered, so you have to plan really well to, you know, execute your movement very carefully. You have to execute. So making uh, making mistakes there uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, it won't allow you to uh, effectively perform uh, whatever you wish to do in case of crowded teeth, especially, you know, uh, when it comes to aligners. But in the case of a fixed appliance that can be effectively performed. People uh, mistake that, uh, you know, you, if you have a mild crowding, a mild crowding, you can easily get away with the aligners. Uh, uh, you know, it's not as simple with the aligners, uh, like how it is simpler with the fixed appliance. So maybe uh, I'm, I, it might be, uh, I don't know. Um, that's one thing. I would say about the effectiveness, where the FA can perform a little better than the aligners in those regions. Thank you, sir. I request the delegates to kindly post their questions in the chat box. Uh, we can now move on to the next topic, which is the recent advances in aligner materials. And this is a topic that not a lot of us are aware of. So the, let us please go ahead with the discussion about recent advances in the aligner materials. Over to you, Dr. Sumit. So, you know, like uh, about the recent advances, uh, as you know, like Dr. Prashant was saying, you know, like uh, companies do keep a lot of information proprietary. So they come, they tell you LD30, EDX30, right? So what I will say, you know, like most of the company which are manufacturing, right? So uh, commercial appliance are thermoplastic, right? So they go through a uh, they do the thermoplastic, uh, you know, like uh, while they are manufacturing the appliance, which degrades a lot of aligner material, and that's where you know, like the properties of the aligner material comes into play. Uh, and when you are doing your own 3D printing, you are not doing thermoplastic; you are laying layer by layer by layer by layer. So you know, like it has to be categorized into two: whether you are doing a uh, whether you are manufacturing your appliance by a process called thermoplastic orientation or you're doing 3D printing, right? So 3D printing has taken us to a completely different route. And uh, a lot today, you know, like we see on social media or, you know, like uh, hear from other people that graphy or, you know, like smart aligner materials are coming into the play. But if you look at it, you know, like most of the publications about that material is coming from the people right, who are talking about that material. I haven't seen a neutral publication coming out from, uh, you know, like a graphy group. The day I see, you know, like we have, we just bought it in our own department. And, you know, like we are trying to understand before I do a clinical trial. But, you know, like uh, maybe it is a superior material. I don't know. You know, like they say it's a night high of, uh, uh, of a liner. But, you know, like just remember, you know, like, Nitai does not perform everything, right? They say, you know, like in the in the hot water, it becomes uh, like Nitai, very soft, but then it becomes uh, stiff. You know, like I haven't uh, worked with the material that much, so 3D printing is a different ball game when you are doing it, right? And if you uh, look at most of 95% of the appliances delivered today, is through thermoplastic, right? And I can just tell you, you know, like it depends on which material you are using. You are using a three-layer versus a five-layer. You are using amorphous versus crystalline. So you know, like all the things, what you are using it totally changes the material properties. And you know, like again, uh, you know, like every person's saliva is different. And you know, like 
that plays a role too. That you know, like it goes into my saliva versus going into somebody else's saliva. So that plays a role too. That how the me mechanical properties will change of the aligner material, which ultimately will define the tooth movement. So at the conclusion, I would like to say you know, like I saw two newer materials, one coming out from Turkey and one from Korea. And all the publications I've seen is from their own uh, key opinion leaders. I haven't seen an unbiased publication till I don't see an unbiased publication. You know, like I'll reserve my thought whether the material is good or bad. And once it comes, uh, an unbiased publication comes out, then you know, like we should talk about it. And thermo farming, you know, like we know that thermo farming has its own drawback. And there are you know, like either uh, most of the people are using. Uh, especially Invisalign is using polyurethane materials, but you know, like other companies have moved on and uh, they are using PETG material and it's very tricky. You know, like I, if I did try to read about their patents, what even in the patents, they keep some part of the secrecy and that's how you know, like uh, it's been done and I cannot say more about it. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the free adapt. So uh, thermoforming have been there for more than 20 years in terms of clear aligner industry. Um, so in the recent uh, two years, we hear the evolution of direct printed aligner. So the first advantage, uh, potential advantage, is it can cut down the workflow. So instead of you print the model, then you make a thermoforming aligner. You can print the aligner directly, and with assumption it can be a good fit or can modify the aligner thickness. But specifically in this area, there is a lot of research needed, um, specifically in terms of um, the material safety, right? Because uh, because the it's, it's directly printed material, you need to have a post processing. Um, so there is a lot of concern about the leaching of the dark printed aligner and the toxicity uh, when the patient we when the patient when the patient wear it. So the, especially the safety and toxicity is, is need to be tackled yet. And also the property of the of the aligner when it's contaminated with saliva um, and the, and the oral 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 cavity environment. Um, I think it is still evolving and it's still a lot to be done. Especially, they claim it have a shape memory property. So when you heat it up, it go back to its original size. Uh, but it could be the future. But in terms of material and science, there is a lot there is a lot to be explored and a lot to be developed at least to make it safe enough for the patient uh, in terms of toxicity and leaching because the post printing processing it may be different and it carry the risk if if you have an error in post processing especially it needs specifically post processing it needs like a nitrogen post processing uh, uh, environment and alcohol post processing environment thank you So uh, the one of the new inventions, like we said, that maybe a year back or a year and a half back is direct printed aligners. And like uh, Dr. Sumit said, that uh, there are uh, one more, two more companies with this kind of material. So the post-processing as such, uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Elnago was telling is that what happens is when you are uh, trying to wash off the, uh, uh, you know, once the 3D printed models are being washed, it's usually washed with the IPA, isopropyl alcohol, and then uh, then you clean it up without any resin, un un uh, unreacted resin, and then you thermoform. But in the case of the direct printed aligners, uh, you cannot wash it with uh, isopropyl alcohol. What needs to be done is it needs to be centrifuged. So the problem with centrifuging is some amount of liquid remains there within the aligner and ill-fitting aligners happens. So that's one uh, main drawback I have seen. And the other drawback is carrying a thermos with hot water, because if you want to wear, the aligners are pretty hard to wear and uh, that's where uh, things are a uh, little difficult. So it's not already my patients uh, you know, complain that we need to remove the aligners while eating and uh, drinking coffee tea because it's thermoformed, hot substances cannot be had. So that's one primary drawback. So probably we need some advancements there where they can, uh, you know, color stability 
and the material stability, there should be a little bit more, uh, you know, things to happen. Then what I see is uh, smart track is one of the uh, proprietary thing what uh, is offered by Invisalign uh, to grip the aligner better. So that I see as not exactly as an advancement, but as a feature which we can uh, deploy during our fabrication. And of course, uh, the multi-layered. In India, we don't have plenty of multi-layered uh, uh, sheets, uh, but they are better than the single-layered sheets which we are using. And we have some good uh, PEG multi-layered sheets. I won't call it as a real big advancement, but for for people in India who want to practice uh, in office aligners, these sheets uh, really perform better than the uh, regular single layer sheets. Uh, apart from that, I don't see, I see some improvements in the in 3D printers. There are some fast 3D printing, uh, printing machines, um, which, uh, uh, which could speed up your uh, aligner processing. Uh, like for example, Eunice is quite, uh, quick, but it is big. Uh, and then what I see as uh, the future is that uh, the, with the direct printed aligners, uh, the carbon uh, footprint reduces, I would feel, I would say. So that's one advantage with these newer material, but there has to be more, uh, uh, you know, uh, science to get in uh, recycling these, uh, uh, you know, resin models which are being fabricated. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. good. The uh, recent uh, advances in the aligner materials uh, can be with respect to the chemical and then the physical things. In chemical, as of now, traditionally, we are using three different types of uh, materials. That is polyurethane, polyethylene, and then polypropylene. Unfortunately, none of these three plastics are ideal or perfect in all the aspects. Each one of them are superior in certain physical and chemical properties and at the same time they are slightly inferior in certain other physical and chemical properties. Now there is a something known as uh, blending. That is the research is going on towards blending. Blending is where we are trying to mix these three different uh, plastics in certain proportions. As of now, 70% of polyethylene and then 10% of polycarbonate and 20% of polyurethane is the one which is working better. Because when we try to analyze these plastics based on certain chemical and physical properties like optical clarity, low deflection rate, resiliency and then shape memory, initial insertion force as well as the working range, comfort, fatigue resistance, moisture resistance, and then its resistance towards discoloration and many other uh, factors, none of them are superior in all the aspects. So the best is to blend each these three in different uh, proportions so as to get a better material which is much superior than each one of them. That is about the chemical aspect, whereas physically, I think research is going towards uh, 4D aligners. So there is something known as 4D aligners. Right now, uh, the patent and the proprietary rights are with uh, Dr. Sharif Kendall of uh, K-Line Europe, where the uh, aligner itself can be converted into two or three different stages. So here what uh, is done is basically the aligner is fabricated in the first step and then given to the patient for the usage for a prescribed number of days that is 10 or 14 days following that these the same aligners can be heat treated using one particular machine okay known as booster at a certain particular temperature wherein the aligners they themselves get converted morphologically into the next step again the patient can use it for a prescribed number of uh, this and then again there is a possibility that it can be used for a third time with a different temperature treatment. Basically these aligners are manufactured using the shape memory plastics. So the 
uh, research is going towards in these two directions. One is blending of the different uh, plastics to get a superior uh, material, and then other is to convert the same aligner into two or three different uh, stages so as to minimize the environmental hazard that we are uh, you know creating out of these uh, plastics by the end of the day thank you um, we have one question which is uh, in the chat the potential cytotoxicity with the use of the thermoplastic materials, can you please briefly comment on the safety concerns of the aligner materials? Uh, basically, the cytotoxicity of any plastic is based on its uh, fatigue resistance, its uh, moisture resistance, and its uh, toughness to withstand the intraoral stresses, especially when it is uh, subjected to the different temperature foodstuffs and then different uh, types of foodstuffs, alkaline, acidic and all those things. So unfortunately, the study says that most of these plastics are cytotoxic in nature. If at all, they have uh, been used for a long time. So the even uh, the studies are uh, directed towards reducing this uh, cytotoxicity, but to a very less success as of now. Thank you, sir. I think I saw Dr. N. R. Krishnamurti, sir, join into the panel discussion. We would like to welcome you, sir. Thank you for joining today. It's a pleasure to be in this forum. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's take on the next topic of discussion, which is staging in Alina orthodontics. We would love to hear your thoughts on the topic of staging in the Alina orthodontics. Dr. Sumit, please uh, unmute yourself. Okay. Obviously, in like, uh staging is a very very important part of uh, aligner treatment and again i will say in like uh, what kind of a malocclusion you are tackling staging a lot depends on that you know like uh, you know, like if you're tackling a distalization right if you're tackling a distalization and uh, if you want to sorry if you want to distalize the second molars the staging will completely be dependent on your second molars and how you use the auxiliaries on that, right? Suppose you have a distalization case, which is 12 year old. You have to distalize the second molar, then the first molar, and then the premolars. So the staging will totally be dependent on your, the first teeth, the second molars. When you are distalizing the second molar, you know what the side effects would be. You know, you know like there's a problem, uh, you know, like of the proclination of the interiors or the anchor loss of the interiors. So you try to give the class two elastics, but you try to run the short class two elastics. So you might run the short class two elastics from the premolars. But when you are distalizing the premolars, you try to run it from the canine, the cl class two elastics up to the lower premolars or lower mandibular molars. You know, like staging is important, but uh, as Dr. Balaji said, you know, like uh, we have to be very careful what load system we are applying. You know, like what kind of a load system we are applying because if you are applying short class two elastics make sure you know, like your force is uh, you know, like if you are applying short class two elastics what's happening you know, like your vector to distalize or to prevent the anchor loss is very small your extrusive vector is bigger but in the long class two elastics you are always the distalization vector is stronger than the extrusive vector so you have to be very careful you know like uh, what you are doing and again you know, like if you are trying to use aligners completely in you know, like uh, extraction case or i would say bidental proclination i have never used a uh, aligner in a bidental proclination i've used uh, in extraction cases but <coughs> in fairly crowded cases where the root position was perfect i have to tip the crown and that's where the staging you know, like if you are doing it in a bidental proclination in which you have to completely close the extraction space you know, like I want to see how people stage it because uh, it becomes very challenging in those kinds of cases, how you stage the aligners, because you know, like you are 
ultimately your staging will depend on the retraction of the canine if you're extracting the first premolar or if you're extracting the second premolar to move the molar forward your staging will depend on the molar so you know, like again the leading tooth takes the toll in the staging and what your goals are and again i would say you know, like i have less experience in the extraction cases uh, especially in the bidental proclination maybe dr balaji can throw much more light on this because he has done more uh, of these kinds of cases because of the malocclusion in india like that thank you yes uh, see when uh, when doing extraction cases uh, what happens is more the moment is going to be tipping moment basically so the uh, tooth is going to you know get into the uh, uh, extraction spaces it's going to tip into the extraction spaces so that's one uh, uh, big problem which we are going to have like dr sumit said probably with some auxiliaries like attachments and uh, class 2 elastics that would really help uh, see uh, when it comes to uh, the staging uh, staging process Uh, we talk about bigger things like you know distillation and extraction and all those things even simple things like you know decrowding you need to stage it because you need to create the space like i told you <clears throat> there is a 360 coverage of the tooth so what happens is it, the tooth cannot just uh, get adjusted very easily so you need to stage the moment like if if it's overlapping like this you have to move out these two teeth lateral incisors and then the central to you know probably come into place so that needs to be staged one more thing what you need to understand about staging is the aligners are going to increase so whenever the patient comes to a clinic they want a cost to be less and the aligners to be less so that's not going to be it's not and people think that aligners are going to reduce uh, sorry the, the aligners are going to reduce your time duration of treatment it's not going to be so when you're going to stage it's going to take around one and a half two years to do a distillation so i mean like uh, you, you have to be aware of these things when we are staging and uh, when you have deep bites staging is becomes very important uh, you know they these staggered approach uh, and you should understand that you are using a removable appliance you're not using a fixed appliance here so when you are using a removable appliance always we say as an undergraduate we are, we teach as well as we have been told that multiple tooth movements cannot be performed in a removable appliances right the same thing holds good in our aligners as well so you cannot perform i mean you cannot move two teeth at one go or you know so in complex tooth movements we are talking about two complex tooth movements cannot be combined together so that's when staging becomes very useful so like dr sumit said you are going to move the molar or whatever it is uh, you know you need to move it separately you cannot move multiple teeth together so that's where staging becomes very useful so in simple cases also you know uh, like a crowding decrowding and all if you don't stage uh, then you are going to have lot of problems uh, you know like loss of tracking which will happen so that's my uh, call on this um, i think uh, staging in clear align is a little bit tricky uh, because in regular braces treatment we we know certain treatment sequence you start with uh, leveling the alignment stage then space closure stage and finishing and detailing uh, but maybe clear align of have the versatility you don't need to start by leveling first like for example but in in the same size there are a lot of tricks you need to tackle so maybe staging you can divide it in term of malocclusion like for crowding cases you need to create space first for example like so the first stage in treatment you need to create space in in deep bite cases or open or open bite cases maybe your first stage is to tackle the open bite or deep bite like for class 2 correction staging you start maybe by distillizing and maybe sequential distillation um so staging is is different according to the malocclusion case and also according to your understanding of the biomechanics and also like staging sometimes you use staging to um to take the limitation of clear aligners so clear aligners like known to be have um less control in terms of movement through lateral incisors so for some cases we need to procline 
push the lateral incisor forward first, then push them down. So this could be also a, a staging. So staging is different according to the malocclusion case and what movement that you need to tackle. Also, a part of your biomechanics. Like for uh, for some cases, we need to have uh, retreatment repositioning for like for extraction cases. Sometimes we add derotation first for the motor to reinforce your anchorage, so you can start before you start retraction. Um, so staging is, is tricky, but uh, it's different between malocclusion and malocclusion. Uh, but you can divide it. It could be a position of space first for any recovery cases, uh, vertical corrections, and uh, like uh, treatment by mechanics variation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, staging uh, is something where we are uh, intended break down the tooth movement in different sequential manner. The best thing about the aligner therapy is that any tooth can be made movable and any tooth can be made immovable at any point of time. So we are utilizing this concept here in staging. So basically staging is done for two reasons. One to preserve the anchorage and then second one is knowingly that the aligner is weak in certain aspects to overtake that. Some of the uh, commonly uh, used uh, uh, situations wherein we are using staging is the, as we discussed already, the displacement wherein we sequentially displace first the second molars, then the first three molars, then the premolars utilizing short class to solve those things. And then uh, the less explored one is the torquing. So especially when it comes to class two due to malocclusions, where you have retroclined and uh, supra erupted uh, uh, incisors. So we also engage staging mm -hmm. here. So here we first procline the incisors and then we intrude and then we retract. Obviously, staging will make the treatment prolonged. So that one thing we should understand here. Also, the last one where the staging can be employed very effectively is the posterior intrusion. So we can sequentially intrude the second molars and then the first molars and then the premolars, which is going to be more predictable in nature. So here, uh, again, uh, to go into little deeper aspects, uh, so the velocity with which the tooth can be moved can be break down in two aspects. One is the linear aspects, another one is the rotational aspects. In both the ways, we can do the staging. So staging has to be planned very properly. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, the teeth may not be cracking. But it is one of the best way to preserve the uh, anchorage in uh, aligner therapy, as well as to take over, I mean, uh, the weakness of the aligners in certain aspects. Thank you, sir. A, pa a delegate has placed the question about periodontal damage with the use of aligners. Damage to the periodontium with the use of aligners. The question here comes is, you know, like, uh, yes, right? Uh, but uh, the fixed appliance does the same thing, right? If there is no inflammation, whether it's aligners or whether it's fixed appliance, you won't see the tooth movement. But do we know how much of an extent of the damage is? We don't know. Just remember, you know, like with aligners, uh, as soon as the tooth moves, even 0 0.1 millimeter, right? The force system changes, right? That's what happens or the load in the all the six dimensions or the three uh, three forces and three moments changes. That's why aligner becomes very, very tricky. That's why spe specifically the attachments, they become very tricky because as soon as the teeth moves 0 0.001 millimeter, that attachment becomes ineffective. So you know, like that where the problem comes is, and you know, like to answer the question, initially you know, like, uh, if your aligners are very tight, you have to be a little bit careful. You know, like it might be applying a little bit more forces on the periodontium. But what forces are more for mine might not be more for you and might not be more for in you know, like uh, different ethnicity. So uh, I would say you know, like every process of a tooth movement damages the periodontium, but then it rebuilds it, right? That's why we say it remodeling, right? Uh, or catabolic and anabolic modeling. So that's what happens in orthodontic tooth movement. 
will it cause more damage than the uh, aligner uh, with a fixed appliance? You know, like the research has not been done, but I don't think so. But you know, like the future uh, will tell us much more about it. But this is you know, like uh, my two cents at this point of the time. Though Invisalign, you know, like has been there from since 1997, but still, you know, like long-term clinical trials or the effect of aligners has not been done. There is varied reasons because you know, like they keep on upgrading the material, right? If you test one material, they will say that hey, we came up with ABC 130. This is more flexible. Now this damage won't happen. Within the five years you will study, they'll come up with a new material. So you know, like it's very tricky. It's not like fixed braces or arch wires where you know, like uh, the things are constant here. The things are ever evolving, and hopefully you know, like once the things become constant, we will have much more knowledge and much more long-term results about the effects on different type of tissues. Um, so, uh, so I, uh, so like Dr. Yadav said, so our liners is a is a force system as our orthodontic brace. So, it depends the amount of force you added to your force system. Um, so, but um, um, th there is a trend that a liner be used for adult patients that have some sort of crowding. Okay, so a lot of um, like so when you do that your digital setup, you should and you should understand the limitation of wound housing. OK, so um, a lot of clinicians tend to have relieved the crowding by pushing the, the, the tooth out, out of the, the wound housing. So there is a re recent article, I think it was in AGADO, they, they, they figure out um, the amount of vertical pool loss in other patients treated with uh, fetal liners. So there is a, a vertical bone loss, but due to the fact that the digital setup tend up to expand the arch too much beyond the other wound housing, um, so that's lead to vertical bone loss. So, so we need to understand the limitation, the biological limitation, um, before we deal with the force system. So we cannot push the limits using just clear aligners. Okay, I think uh, that's this is good to summarize. Thank you. you know, uh, just since uh, uh, Dr. Al Nagar brought very very important point, you know, like, and I would say, you know, like, if you are doing a vertical bone loss and you know, like and we have published in AGO and you know, like uh, be very careful you know like horizontal bone loss can be regenerated vertical bone loss you are not able to regenerate right so you are creating a vertical bone defect in that patient you can regenerate but you know, like suppose you are losing two millimeters there is no way you can regenerate more than 0 0.5 millimeters horizontal bone loss has been shown to be regenerated but whereas vertical bone loss cannot be regenerated in humans. So be very careful, you know, like as Dr. Al Nagar uh, mentioned, very, very important point actually. Yeah, while uh, treating uh, periodontally compromised cases, uh, if it's not related to aligners, and I think uh, Dr. Sumit explained very well, it's got the similar effects like a fixed appliance. Uh, but when you are treating a periodontally compromised patient, let's say, uh, in that situations, uh, I feel we can, uh, uh, the velocities can be controlled with an aligner, unlike, uh, you know, in the fixed appliance, we can have more control uh, if you are designing your own aligners with your CAT software. So I, uh, we treat few of the periodontally compromised patients that way. And uh, one important thing when you are treating periodontally compromised patients, what I've seen with my personal experience is that the trim lines, the trim line uh, is where how much the aligner is going to extend over the teeth. So if you're going to have a high trim line and then it can in a compromised periodontally compromised patients that would uh, cost more damage, uh, like few of the companies, they uh, you know, they give a high trim line, so it might not be you have to give a low trim line, uh, you know, this thing so that it doesn't damage the gums much. So these are few observations what I have made during a uh, course of treating these sort of patients. Yes. Uh, from our side, from the doctor's perspective, the periodontal damage can happen and we can take care in two aspects one to control the initial insertion force and then to have the long working range so these are the two things where we can play around you know some of the materials which are rigid for example 
polypropylene where the sex is basically a polypropylene material will have a very high initial insertion force and it has a very less working range on the other hand if you use polyurethane okay and even the tc uh, that is the uh, uh, direct printing aligners have very uh, less initial insertion force and they have a long working range so these are the two things where we can definitely prevent any periodontal uh, breakdown to a larger extent thank you sir for your detailed answers the next topic which we will be tackling is the differences between the utility of conventional and the optimized attachments in aligners you know like, uh, it's a very different uh, difficult topic just because uh, if you look at some of the recent publications right uh, uh, first of all the mechanics regarding the attachments is very voodoo at this point of the time right what uh, invisalign proposes uh, about you know like their conventional attachments were three and now there are so many attachment types size shapes and you know like uh, totally depending on and they are still thermoforming which makes me a little bit worried because you know like when you are thermoforming uh, your at attachments and the trade doesn't you know like always seat very well together or the force system is very complex at that point of the time and you know like uh, as i said in my previous discussion if you look at it you know like uh, when you are thermoforming 80% of your tooth movement is still without the attachments so 10 to 20% attachment plays a part 80% of the tooth movement if, even if you just thermoform without attachments you will get it so you know like attachment becomes a little bit complex and uh, i've been trying to do certain research on using the attachments and two days back you know, like there was a publication through uh, virginia commonwealth university by bhavna shroff and neil kravitz and they used three different kinds of attachments uh, smart attachments to see the extrusion of the incisors and they found out uh, can you please unmute yourself dr sumit sir Uh, so i was just saying you know, like there was a very recent research right uh, coming out from vcu with dr bhavna shroff and uh, neil kravitz and they showed that you know like they used three different kinds of attachments and they showed that i don't know why i'm becoming muted every time uh, but you know like and then you know like dr nanda and his group uh, kenji ojima just published in angle orthodontist they showed that you know like only one attachment type is sufficient to do all the kind of tooth movement so you know like i have always believed in it you know like uh, my i along with my mentor a uh, mechanical engineer you know like we have looked at different attachments and uh, to me you know like uh, attachment at this point of the time does it help yes you know like because 20% of the tooth movement is pretty good but can i predict without the attachments uh, uh, can attachments Are, are attachments very effective? I don't know the answer to that. You know, like I have used uh, reveal aligners through Henry Shine, and I've used Invisalign. I can tell you, you know, like uh, on a similar mal occlusion, they would perform 90 90% similarly. And reveal doesn't have any attachments, and Invisalign has all the attachments. And you know, like uh, you will see my paper coming out very soon. You know, like we have done some good studies with those and. Uh, so uh, i would just conclude by saying does attachment has utility yes but uh, how much is a utility it's very questionable because as soon as the teeth moves 0.1 mm your attachment for that movement is ineffective thank you to the other have summarized but uh, we need to understand that the term optimized or smart attachment it just have been promoted by certain industrial company right uh, and but at the end of the day attachment is attachment the difference between um, regular attachment or what's called optimized attachment it is the shape of the attachment so the optimized attachment have certain shape it have been optimized by elite industrial company it have uh, but overall the, the what what we need the attachment for 
So the idea of attachment is to increase the push surface. We can put, have a, a more push surface for the for, for uh, the aligners, and also to have more more attention for the clear aligners. Um, does it aligners work better? Overall, the aligner maybe be work better if you have attachment versus no attachment. But if the attachment shape matter, um, actually there is not too much um, uh, research around. But for certain type of movement, we have fr like from clinical experience, you, you can tell like for intrusion, we have like gingival, you have, we have incisor bibular attachment. For extrusion, you have gingival bibular attachment. That's what we used to be in term of clinical term. Uh, but is there any significant difference in term of root control for like for optimized root control attachment? For versus regular attachment. Um, sometimes when I do clinical setup for clear aligners, I take off the optimized attachment. I, I put much, much different attachment. I think it, uh, in my mind, it maybe work better for rotation control because it have more push surface than the optimized attachment. So I, I, so it's still a, a tricky situation, but, but we need uh, more research. But the major difference between them is just the shape of attachment. So does it really matter? It depends on your mechanic and, and your setup and w which direction, which posture that you want. Thank you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so with the uh, my uh, uh, view about the conventional and the optimized are that uh, see conventionals are basically little bigger attachments and uh, optimized are you know they have uh, aesthetically more pleasing. And uh, when you uh, and it will be much easier to remove the aligner from these attachments. Clinically, the patient doesn't find it very difficult to remove and put it back. But the conventional attachments, they might find it a uh, little more difficult uh, uh, to remove and put back the attachments. And when you're going to uh, put attachments on multiple teeth, then uh, the optimized attachment, which uh, has got uh, you know, uh, only one surface uh, which uh, tries to give the force uh, is more helpful. Uh, I would also say that uh, uh, for correcting uh, rotations and uh, the thing, these attachments are more effective. And in the anterior teeth, uh, they serve a little bit of, uh, less purpose uh, for the regular movements, maybe for. Uh, um, um, I mean, uh, like extrusive movements, uh, it's very uh, little bit difficult to extrude teeth uh, without attachments because of the watermelon seed effect, uh, because of the, you know, the, both the aligners, they are narrowing towards anterior. Anteriorly, they slide down. So without the attachments, they are, uh, it's going to be a little difficult to extrude teeth. Uh, so by that way, even uh, as a in-house aligner practitioner, when I have some confusion with regards to attachments, I always, uh, you know, rely on the conventional attachments. Uh, I feel they do the job. Uh, uh, like I said, there are few cases which I proceed even without attachments, though we design the attachments digitally and it comes out well. So uh, that's my call about whether be it optimized or uh, uh, you know, conventional attachments. Uh, when we go through the literature, you know, only two types of tooth movements can be achieved through aligner therapy without attachments. One is the tipping type of tooth movement, and the second one is rotation of the anterior teeth, which has flat coronal surface. Other than these two, tipping and the rotation of anterior teeth having flat coronal surface, for rest, all the type of tooth movements, we definitely need attachments. Without attachments, we won't be able to achieve any of these other type of tooth movements. And when it comes to conventional versus uh, optimized attachments, as uh, Professor Elena defined, optimized attachments is basically a company promotion. Most of the tooth movements which requires attachments can be achieved with the conventional type of tooth movements, especially with that to mainly vertical and horizontal rectangular attachments are more than sufficient to achieve more than 95% of the tooth movements. But most of the type of tooth movements, we definitely need attachments to achieve the uh, predictable tooth movements. 
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, one of the delegates have raised this question. Uh, do properly plan does properly planned staging um, avoid additional aligners, avoid the need for additional aligners in different types of malocclusion? I think always uh, staging will definitely lengthen the treatment time as well as the number of aligners. It is nothing to do with the lessening the number of aligners, rather it is something to do with the anchorage conservation. And to make uh, the two moments uh, more predictable. I think his question mean need the uh, redo of refinement. So after you do in your initial setup, so yes. for uh, many cases we do another scan for another set of aligners. Yeah. Um, so if you have a, a good digital setup, uh, at, so that that's due to the fact you don't get what you planned from the, your digital setup hundred percent for for a certain movement, and um, that's why. For some many cases, we do over engineering in the digital setup. So if you do digital setup um, uh, and you understand the mechanics, and you can maybe add over engineering, like you add over correction for the rotation, um, over correction for deep bytes, it may reduce the number of refinement and the number of trays at the refinement. But for for many cases, like maybe I, I would say for eighty percent of the cases, um, you will need refined trays. Uh, because the plastic itself um, is not, you don't get exactly the, what you did in your digital setup. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next topic, which is the menace of do it yourself aligners and how to tackle this growing challenge. We would love to hear your thoughts on this, sir. Wow, you know, like I won't advise do it yourself aligners. And you know, like there was a company here, a Smile Direct Club, and there might be other companies too, but Smile Direct Club became a, a household name. And as you can see, you know, like the stock market or the value of the company has declined. And every one of us might have seen some of the problems. Uh, I've seen some of their some of their patients. Who had you know like a uh, severe mobility of the teeth and was corrected. We have to splint some of those teeth for before initiating any tooth movement. And I'm sure you know like uh, every other uh, people treating here the Smile Direct Club uh, or sorry, doing the normal orthodontics might have got some patients from the Smile Direct Club, and it might have worked in some patients too. And that's how it became popular. But you know like. Uh, in what patient it worked, I don't know, but I would just say, you know, like we have to be very cautious because you know, like uh, you are taking the treatment in your hand rather than the treatment uh, with a, a trained orthodontist or dentist. And that becomes, you know, like the way they market, right? The marketing was the whole game and how they popularized it, marketing and cheap orthodontics. That's the way they popularized it and faster orthodontic treatment. They used to say, you know, like uh, you can finish the treatment in seven to eight months, six months, close the gap in six months. And you know, like uh, what kind of the material they were sending, I just got a hand off one of the, their aligners and it was pretty stiff material. And other than that, you know, like, uh, other than that, I haven't seen any company booming uh, like Smile Direct Club in US at least. Yeah, uh, I think uh, so. The way it works it, is you skip the doctor. You have what's called direct to customer liners. Uh, so, with assumption, they used to send the patient a box full of uh, impression material, or recently they have an open shop. You just go take a scan and they, they ship back a liner. So, we need to understand that they, they're making this aligners first without having a patient exam, um, without having proper x rays. And so you don't, the, the lack of proper diagnosis and treatment planning, it just is treating up these on the screen uh, and they send back trays for this patient. So um, myself, I had, I had many patients who have been done direct to customer and they come back um, either with unfitted aligners with, uh, um, with many complications um, and have been retreated, retreating them. It was a, a, a trend in the last two years uh, but from my experience, I see that the, the side effect have been shown for many patients. So now it's, it's declining uh, that we see in our sites. 
um, uh, it, it, it target. I think the way it, it works because it targeted a different group of patients or a patient who who may not actually go for orthodontics or for orthodontist. Like it, it, the 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 marketed like it can have a half price of the bracket, um, and also it's a lot of false information there. Uh, but what I see is the trend is going down, and um, the, many patients have been gone to orthodontist. So um, we need to know this unsupervised treatment that lacked proper diagnosis, treatment and planning. Um, and actually, just to be orthodontist, you need to go to the school and do residency and to, to treat a certain amount of patients. You can't just skip that by straightening up teeth on the screen. Um, it's not going to work. So the same way, you can not just um, treat yourself from any kind of uh, internal medicine disease. So um, I don't think it will, hopefully it, it doesn't grow, it will decline and hopefully disappear. And eventually, you know, like I'll just make a comment, you know, like Smile Direct Club started opening offices. And because as Dr. Al Nagar said, the ill-fitting uh, aligners was the biggest problem. So they started opening the offices where dental assistants or dental hygienists were scanning. And one of the prominent offices were in the Man uh, Manhattan in New York. And I think so it's still open, but the number of patients have decreased considerably. And they started scanning so that the aligners could fit better. See, uh, my personal opinion in India, so I won't call it as a do-it-yourself aligners. It's direct to consumers aligners, basically. Okay, uh, but I don't, uh, uh, they are not the only people, uh, you know, whom I am totally against. Like, I am also against corporate aligners, companies, see, which, you know, keep us in the dark, right? They don't let us know how, how to go about, you know, what is happening, you know. They just give you, uh, you know, you just need to send all the information to them, like your x-rays then photographs and they give you the design plan and everything so it's easier for you so that that is the first step which uh, has led to direct to consumer aligners so these people you know they just uh, you know they they do so much of marketing like they said that you know spacing and the closure right so they don't know what is the reason for spacing the patient and the worst bit is you uh, the uh, you know there are a few patients who call me up in my clinic you know uh, asking me whether i can come home and do a scan rather than they coming here they said i can't do it now then i don't want the treatment so that's the kind of uh, uh, the thing they are setting you know that that's the kind of level they are setting there's only one or two companies in india which are doing this and there are multiple companies in the us uh, which are doing this and uh, knowing about how the aligner works, knowing about the materials and making it part of the curriculum uh, during the uh, post-graduation, uh, uh, this thing would help in curbing all these things. People will understand as to what to do. And like I would say, see the prosthodontist when they do a crown preparation, right? So they send the uh, prepared to to the lab in india to get a crown that's how the process should be for the aligners as well the science the designing everything should be with the orthodontist and only the aligner manufacturing should be with the lab we have to start learning which we are not doing here so that is what that is why these companies are growing right so that's my take on the direct to consumer aligners. I, I, I do agree with uh, the other panelists that uh, we should be, uh, you know, raising our voices against these direct to consumer aligners. And uh, we should uh, propose that the always the treatment should be under the orthodontist guidance. And I also uh, support uh, Dr. Uh, Balaji in two aspects. One is that uh, orthodontist, orthodontist should be an active participant in the treatment planning by the uh, companies, corporate companies. There are very few corporate companies where they really take their own opinion in fabrication of the 
Alliance and most of the companies they just take the data from you and they directly give you the plan. So that should not be the way. Orthodontist should be actively involved in the treatment plan so that the execution also should lie uh, with the orthodontist uh, uh, in a purview. So uh, I I I agree with the other panel members in this regard. Thank you so the, much. The only, the only way he is to tackle is to uh, most of the times, I think it is only through the in house uh, fabrication. No, do I mean, uh, we, we, we should promote that as much as possible you know, uh, uh, to most of the orthodontists to scan yourself, to use the software yourself, to print the models, and then to second the aligners on your own. That's the only way to tackle these uh, direct to consumer aligners. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of our participants, Dr. Sunanda, has a question. I request uh, Dr. Sunanda, ma'am, to kindly unmute and ask the question. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I had a question to Dr. Sumit Yadav. Could you please clarify? when you said that the attachment stops working or is it it becomes ineffective the moment the tooth moves by 0.001 mm i was i always believed that the attachments are working until the tooth movement is complete whichever i mean the designed tooth movement for that particular number of aligner thank you very much yeah, you know, like uh, it's so we did a, a bit of a biomechanics research and we planted the attachments and we saw how the force system changed and we staged it 0 0.10 actually. So I should put it 0 0.10 and we saw how the force system when we placed the first aligner and we placed the aligner after point, 0 0.10 tooth movement, the force system was completely in a different direction. So I would, I, when I was trying to say that, I was just trying to say that the force system you are thinking will have will immediately change as the tooth is moving. So you know, like it becomes indeterminate mechanics. So that's where I was saying that you know, like uh, the force system is complex and we still don't understand. The only you know, like I agree with Dr. Ba uh, Dr. Pr uh, Prashant on one thing is you know, like or Dr. Al Nagar or Dr. Balaji, and like in all three, that if you have a small surface area, you need a retention, especially in the molar area, right? We do place an attachment, and that gives you more with the more flexible uh, appliance system coming out. You do get more retention, and if the trays are not retaining properly, for sure the force system is not there. Okay. And then since you brought out this, I would like to tell you, you know, like the bigger your attachment is, right? And you will see our research coming out on this too. You know, like the bigger your attachment is, the more the deformation of the tray. And the more the deformation of the tray through thermoforming, the more the force system would be very complex. And that's where the problem comes is, I see, you know, like uh, people putting these big attachments on, you know, like for extrusion, intrusion on the incisors, which makes me a little bit worried that you know, like uh, probably the force system is not very clear because that part of the tray is deformed. And I again say that 80% of the tooth movement is because of thermoforming. And there the tray is deformed. And if you clearly, if you can see that, uh, you know, like you won't see clear active and passive surfaces, right? Tooth moves because through an active surface, the force is applied. But these all complications goes away if you are doing direct printer uh, direct 3d printing which dr balaji is doing you know, like all these complications goes away because you know, like with direct 3d printing it's layer by layer layer by layer layer by layer and your attachment integration to the tray becomes much better thank you so much Uh, any of the other delegates, if you have any questions, now would be the time to post them or so you again, can unmute like, yourself. Like, and I would like to bring in, like, as Dr. Al Nagar said, you know, like staging, right? And when we do uh, 
uh, fixed appliances, we know we'll do alignment first, we'll do retraction second, and we'll complete it, right? But in the aligners, uh, as Dr. Balaji was explaining, even the rotation, right? We'll plan small, 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 till the last tray, we'll finish the rotations correction. So, you know, like we did the research and we showed that, you know, like, because you know, like there is no sequencing in the aligners. So what we showed that the relapse was more prone in the aligner cases compared to the fixed appliances. Because what happens is till the last stage, you are correcting the rotations, right? Whereas in the fixed appliances, you have corrected your rotations in the first six months and you have let the periodontal ligament heal or the transeptal fiber heal. But here you are doing it till the last tray. And if you remove the tray, if your patient is a little bit uncooperative, you will see more rotations. Our issue will, our paper will come out in November and we use both 3M and uh, uh, 3M Clarity Aligners and uh, Invisalign. We did not found the difference in the relapse, but there was a significant amount of relapse with both the aligners. So you have to be very careful, you know, like uh, with aligners, retention becomes a very important part of our, it's with uh, any other malocclusion too, but with aligners, since we are correcting, you know, like slowly, slowly, slowly till the last tray, either we do it, make sure that the patient keep on wearing a passive tray and we don't tell them that your treatment is finished or somehow, you know, like uh, they have to wear the retainers very properly, very meticulously. Otherwise, you will see some kind of a relapse. That's you know, like my last thought because that's what we saw and we did the research and you will see that publication coming out. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the detailed discussion and sharing all of your knowledge. At this point, I would like to request Dr. N. R. Krishnaswamy, sir, if he is still online, to present a few remarks or his, his views on this topic. I think we may have just lost Dr. N. R. K. Sir. Any of the other delegates who wish to ask any uh, questions to the panel members can please do so now. You can either place it in your chat box or unmute yourself and ask. Uh, I just want to make one point about the attachments. Uh, uh, like Dr. Sumit said, uh, see, however good the attachment may be, the attachment is not going to move the teeth. It's the aligner which is going to move the teeth. And that has got uh, uh, the properties of the aligners are going to help moving the teeth. So the corporate companies, uh, you know, they create a misconception. It's very important to have an attachment and, you know, this, the, this, that about the attachment, making attachment as a, you know, big figure. Uh, so that's why, that's why sometimes, you know, I just uh, show them that we can move the teeth without attachments as well. But I'm not saying I'm not against attachments or anything like that. But it's the plastic which is important. And many of these companies, corporate companies, which are giving aligners, so they'll give you a fantastic attachment, you know, copying a big, bigger company attachment, but there won't be any movement in the tooth because of poor use of plastics to, you know, make some profits. So yes. that is more important, you know, uh, the material aspect. So I may ask uh, Dr. Sumit, uh, is the 3M Clarity the five-layered one? And so you like, is... again, so they say, yeah, I have both five layers and three layers, right? So, or now they are saying both are five layers, but right. initially like it was flex and force, right? So they right. say flex for initial tooth movement, force for uh, later, force for later tooth movement, or uh, when you need more stiffness. You know, like what Dr. Balaji said uh, was very essential just because you know, like attachments are like brackets, right? And wires are like aligners. So it's all the game of the materials. And you know, like, uh, and the attachment position is very important, like the bracket position. And I would, you know, like, I would again hold my thoughts till more research come on attachments. But you know, like, I completely concur with uh, Dr. Balaji. And our research uh, of we have used both. You know, like initially we were using force, uh, 3M Clarity force. Now you know, like they have both and they will tell you uh, if you go to their software, they'll tell you when they are giving you uh, flex versus force. So initial stages for sure you will get some flex material and then for certain kind of tooth movement, 
in between you will have uh, three and four strays. So is it more like the uh, uh, Invisalign kind of a system, the 3M is? Yeah, it is. It is very good system. So you know, like our recent uh, publication, which just came out, it shows that mm -hmm. you know, like Invisalign and uh, uh, 3M both performed equally well in okay. uh, mild to moderate malocclusion, but 3M had a better control on the transverse. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, but I would say my sample size was just 35, 37. Because you know, like 95% of the US market, let's put it 90% of the US market is still Invisalign, but 3M yeah. is catching up. And uh, hopefully you know, like 3M and then there's this company which uh, uh, you know, like Strawman uses, ClearCorrect uses. Uh, Zendura. Uh, Zendura, right? Zendura, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's catching up. Like they came out with Zendura Viva now. And Viva is pretty good too, and pretty good too. I've just used in one case, one case, but uh, Viva is pretty good too. And so are these sheets, the 3M sheets, available like Zendura in the market? No, no, no. they won't. No, like, they are like what, smart. Track. Like these are all Invisalign and 3M are that big companies, right? right As you correct. said, they don't want to. With them, yeah. Or you don't go with them. That's it. You have to agree with them, or you don't agree with them. Agreed. Whereas Zendura is, you know, like uh, Bay Materials, right? Uh, ID Strawman is very big, but they just bought Bay Materials uh, three years Good. back or four years back. And uh, so Bay Materials has Zendura. Now they came out with Zendura Viva, and I just use their material. You can buy their sheets. And other than right. that, right. Of the, those companies sell the, sell the sheets. So it's very tricky to understand right. their properties. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I think one of the delegates have posed a question. Um, is the hybrid approach the way forward in justifying finishing of cases instead of succumbing to the limitations of just one particular appliance? If you are okay with the cost, I'm fine. You're right. You're like, if you are okay with the cost is a big problem. And the second problem comes here is convincing the patient, telling the patient, hey, first I will do Invisalign, then I will do braces. The patient might say, why don't you do just braces, right? Or why don't you just do Invisalign? Then you will say, oh, Invisalign is not effective. Then why are you doing it on me if it's not effective, right? Something like that will always, I've tried. It's tough for, you know, like I wouldn't say that. I've tried in some surgical cases and the later on, I have put them on Invisalign, you know, like when the time period ex extended a lot. But you know, like it's tough to convince patients. It's, this is just me and then you know, like, if you are ready to invest more and more, patient is not going to pay more. If you are ready to invest more, I think so. It's acceptable, and a lot of people like I hear in AO they show some good cases with uh, with hybrid approach, and I want to see a long term publication. But you know, like hybrid approach is that okay? I'm not able to correct with Invisalign now. I will do with braces. So this is my understanding of hybrid approach. Yes, but a lot of people are doing hybrid approach. Yeah, so uh, actually you can use hybrid approach, but in very, um, you need to be a big in terms of case selection. So I use hybrid, I use hybrid approach for, to, sorry for the noise, um, for two types of cases. So you usually don't start with one appliance and switch to the other one, right? Um, so the first scenario, um, for certain type of movement, especially for severe rotation, in which you have enough space, um, so you really cut the tray at the distal end and just have sectional wire in one side, just connecting four or five teeth, right? And then you have one tooth connecting between the two segments. It have like a, an Invisalign with attachment and also have a bracket. So it may cut up some time in terms of, uh, uh, you can efficacy can control the rotation first, especially like molar rotation or, or when you have enough space. And the other side, and and the other side, I use hybrid approach. In, it's not hybrid approach concept, like for, for surgery first cases, because usually the surgeon like have fixed prices for IMA fixation. Um, so I, I I do sectional brackets with pass wire two weeks before the surgery, and mm -hmm. and in the same time I do the digital setup. And once the patient come back from the surgery, I leave him for rubber bands for settling for um, four or five weeks. Then I take off the brace and start the line treatment. But the patient understand, but hybrid, but it's not switching from one appliance to another. It just maybe sectional wire to to get some type of movement, 
just like rotations uh, in most of the cases and for surgery first cases. And there is some um, 3M company, they offer you, you can have hybrid setups. You can have brackets and same way we have aligners. I think uh, Oramco Spark is something having to, but it's, yeah, very, um, it's just signal um, wire and surgery first cases, but it's not switching. There is some clinician who do like upper Invisalign and lower fixed traces, but it's hard to finalize. And then you define it, it depending on your diagnosis, but certain moment basic irritation first. My, my so, way of understanding the hybrid appliance is to integrate the fixed appliance in the aligner therapy. As we know, certain type of tooth movements are a little difficult and tricky to achieve with the uh, clear aligners. We can always integrate a suctional fixed appliance in order to achieve that more effectively. I have done in one or two cases uh, wherein we had one side premolar extraction and the Invisalign told it cannot be done in moderate patient didn't want to pay for the comprehensive. So what I have done is I just asked between the molars and the first premolar, the power arms, which also has the rectangular molar tips. I inserted a rectangular suctional wire and I started using the uh, E chain between the two power chain, uh, the power arms. So which can be uh, I comfortably closed within around the 22 to 23 sets in the initial line. In another case where I had one submerged four sets, that is the first molar in the fourth quadrant. So I used the sectional wire between uh, four, five that submerged the six and to the seven and I comfortably made it get up into perfect occlusion. So these are the things wherein we can uh, cut down the number of aligners and uh, make the tooth movements more predictable using suctional wires. Only thing is that convincing the patient is a little tricky. So uh, hybrid in the sense what they were asking, I think in the chat, uh, uh, hybrid approach, the way forward in justifying finishing of cases. So I had a situation where in which we uh, we had a sort of a class two division two kind of a case uh, where we unravel the anteriors, everything, but we were not able to correct the deep bite, uh, which was a little difficult at the end after all first premolar extraction. So what we did was uh, we had put a couple of implants in the anteriors to intrude the anteriors by making some uh, you know, cuts on the, uh, you know, aligners to intrude and it's happening uh, well. So maybe this would have been a little difficult, you know, intruding more than two mm in the anteriors is going to be a little bit of a difficult situation. And those situations, uh, you know, an hybrid approach would definitely help uh, in getting a proper outcome to that particular uh, cases. So finishing might be, uh, you know, some uh, like I, I think that's what uh, the person who had asked meant hybrid, meaning adding up something else along with the aligners to finish. Of course, stay. Uh, uh, the others also spoke about so many things. I think uh, pertaining to that, yes, adding up some more things uh, to finish it in a better manner is the way forward. Maybe now. But with the improvements in the materials and you know things, it can change. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the last question is: What is the difference between um, Invisalign and Reveal Company aligners? That is, what material does the Reveal aligner use? This question is specific for Dr. Sumit, sir. Uh, you make it proprietary. Nobody tells it, right? Even yeah. I don't know. Invisalign uses, I know it's polyurethane, both are polyurethane. Reveal is from Henry Schein. They just say that you don't require attachments with our material. And uh, they have a patent on it. If you want, I can send it to you. But you know, like, uh, uh, it's very tough to understand. As you know, like Dr. Balaji and we were discussing, we don't get their sheets. So testing anything becomes so tricky because once you thermoform it, uh, the property changes considerably. Until you don't get the plain sheets, understanding those materials would be very different. 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I think we have uh, uh, overshot our time expectation as well. And uh, I'd like to conclude today's panel discussion by thanking all the subject experts. Uh, the tricky part for us for this panel discussion was to find subject experts in this new topic. And we have selected four experts from all across the world. And we thank you all because you all gave a very unique perspective of about which based on your strengths and your experiences. And that was, I think, uh, instrumental in us understanding this topic better. So I'm deeply indebted to the speakers who have shared their knowledge with us today. I thank all the delegates as well who have registered for this webinar and have participated so actively with all posing so many questions. I'd like to also thank our Dean, Dr. Silju sir, and uh, the entire staff of the orthodontics department for all their help and support and my postgraduates. I over to Dr. Silju sir for a few concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharani. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, each one of the uh, panelists for a wonderful uh, discussion on a topic which is so hot and happening, uh, I think, in, not only in India, but across the world. Aligners is something which is new. And I, as I understand, uh, as I've read in some of the literature that, you know, slowly uh, in the US, about 35% uh, to 40% of the practice is shifting to aligners. Whereas in India, it's about 10% uh, and growing and growing exponentially. So uh, this going to play a major role in the future. It is technology in, in uh, uh, intense. There's a lot of things happening every day. You have something new which has been brought out in the market. There's a race going among companies to come out with the best and the better materials. And I'm sure uh, there are exciting times ahead uh, with the evolution of uh, newer products and new technology. The scanners that we use, we use it, and in a year's time it becomes redundant as you come, they, they come out with even a better uh, uh, scanners uh, with more features and much more better clarity and depth and resolution. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful time, uh, an exciting time. As someone said, you know, aligners is a beast. We have to learn to tame it before it eats you. So I must thank uh, Dr. Sumit Yadav for a wonderful uh, input, a very, very uh, research uh, articles. I think it was wonderful listening to you. I thank uh, Dr. Elna for a very insightful and intellectual inputs. And I thank Dr. Balaji for a very frank and uh, uh, a spade is a spade uh, input because he's one who's uh, uh, working a lot on uh, in-house aligners and uh, your inputs and your clinical tips are very useful. And I, I like the way you said, the only way to tackle DIY or do, do it yourself is for orthodontists to do it yourself. Educate yourself, learn how to use it. Don't become slaves of the company. You don't postpone uh, the planning and hand it over to the company to do it for you. You do it and ask them to manufacture. That's the only way you can tackle it. These companies are huge. They are mighty. They have huge bank balances. You can't take them head on. You only thing you can do is by being smart and educating yourself and doing it yourself and uh, letting the companies do what they are good at, that is uh, printing and manufacturing. So that was a very good takeaway message. I thank uh, Dr. Prashant uh, uh, for a wonderful insight into the biomechanics part of it. You know, I think you have given some very, very critical inputs on biomechanics, uh, which I'm sure the, the audience would have really, uh, related to it and would have really you know, comprehended it uh, in the day-to-day -day practice. And finally, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sharanya for a wonderful comparing of the event, uh, the way you uh, maneuvered through the questions and you got the answers from the chat. Uh, using the questions in the chat and getting the answers was wonderful. Thank you for a wonderful comparing and uh, taking the entire discussion forward. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the delegates. I think uh, we had some of the very senior people from uh, various parts of the world. We also had some senior uh, clinicians, ex teachers, academicians, researchers from across the country who join us today. I thank them and finally to the postgraduate students uh, I think they would have benefited a lot. And as uh, one of the panelists said, you know, we need to put it up in the curriculum, uh, in the orthodontic uh, teaching, so that they educate themselves. And when they go out in the market, they are not at the mercy of these mercenary or the, uh, the corporate people who actually take away the 
whole concept of planning from them and they make them only pure clinicians and not thinkers. So with these few words, I would like to thank all the uh, panelists. I also thank uh, Professor Allah Reddy, uh, who has been very instrumental in organizing and facilitating this event, the entire team at UIC and everybody at our department for working towards the grand success of this event. Thank you one and all, and have a wonderful day ahead. It would be uh, morning in the US and night in, back in India. Have a great time ahead. Till we meet again. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all the delegates. Thank you. Thank you.